a lot of accountants confuse people, right? Because there is a mortgage strategy and there is an accountant strategy. And then the buyer's agent is basically trying to become the catalyst between the two. A lot of accountants would basically say point blank, you should never buy a negatively geared property. I, and I understand why is why they're saying that. You should never buy a negatively geared property in a trust because you're locking your losses. You can claim that in your own personal name. But what they're not seeing is if the rents keep growing and if they keep paying the debt down, then in year two or year three or year four, you're in a position where the t- trust debt is basically, you know, disappeared from your balance sheet completely. Oh, yeah. And you get your servicing back, right? <laughs> You're listening to Help Me Buy Property Podcast, powered by Investor Partner Group. We help improve lifestyles by building scalable and sustainable generational wealth and passive income streams. We do this via our ecosystem that is a one-stop shop to all property investment needs. From evidence-based, data-driven buyers agency, industry-renowned portfolio reviews and property strategies, property development with and for clients, tax, SMSF, business structures advisory and cash flow real estate everything we do is to help people achieve financial independence and not just basic financial freedom by using property as a tool and as a medium presently we've launched australian property academy where we are training and teaching buyers agents property advisors property strategic partners and secrets to finding investor grade properties to student investors connect now to experience it yourself or drop in a line below at info at helpmebuy.com.au to get more information. Be kind and happy investing. Hello and welcome to Help Me Buy Property Podcast. Today we are talking about structures and importance of structures. We're talking about selling of bad investments. We're talking about better opportunities. We're talking about why don't you keep all your eggs in one basket when it comes to banks and why should you not be loyal to the bank in order to, to talk about all of this stuff let's introduce drum roll hong from strategic brokers hong how are you today yeah good thanks good um, i'm you for having you uh, thanks for having us on the show again yeah no so you know as it comes to structure i think we spoke in previous episodes about you know a big having that big picture in yeah. mind yeah kind of figure out where it is that you want to be and you know, kind of reverse engineer that, right? And yeah. Or how do we get there? You know, so probably start off with maybe your pair YG guys again. Yep. So yeah, you know, it's all it's always a bit very sturdy with numbers with them, but mm. you know, it's very important about their finance strategy where they start with. You know, whether they buy in their individual name, whether they yep. buy in a trust. I'm sure you've had this on episodes before, but you know, the importance of actually really understanding how that changes the algorithm yeah is really so important. really important right so you, you know, pair yg guys they usually can be if they're property investors they're usually quite rigid with their savings they're very you know yeah. very um they have to be quite lean yes and they have to be solid savers right mm. because they have to keep accumulating deposits yeah because at some point they can't draw equity out yeah then because they'll like, get stuck right because their income is not grow- growing it's not going to grow but like 10, 15, 20% like a normal business would grow, right? So yeah, they only have finite means to basically go in that direction. Forget all the other purposes that people say about buying in trust, you know, obviously for asset protection, you know, yeah. accountants could sell it for a million different reasons, right? Yeah. But uh, on a lending perspective, um, you know, there are funders out there. I'm sure people have spoken about this in the past. You hear it, it's all the buzz at the moment uh, that if the trust is deemed profitable mm. and um, that, you know, there's banks who won't look at that. So if, imagine you had a million dollars borrowing capacity, you borrowed a million dollars in the trust mm. and at some point the rents went up, you've amortized or paid down some of that debt. Yeah. You know, you somehow managed to, you know, reduce the accounting fees, whatever you did to get everything, the cost base down. Yeah. And eventually that, it turns a $1 profit. Yeah. Right. That trust is now deemed profitable. Yeah. Your million dollars that you had as borrowing power, which was down to zero, right now goes back to a million dollars and yeah. you might now buy and you might have saved a deposit yeah. and you decided I'm going to buy some more property in another truck yeah. now. And people don't understand this, right? You know, I was explaining this to a client the other day. It's it's a very basic mechanics, you know, from a bank's perspective, okay? When the bank is, and this is how I understand this, okay? When the bank is assessing a, a profile, they are making a self-assessment, right? So they're like, okay, I'm going to put a risk margin on their interest rate. I'm going to shave up their income by blah. I'm going to, you know, increase their expenses by blah. So they are basically doing a self-assessment in-house, right? And so you might get a loan at 6%, but they might be assessing you at 9, 9.5%, right? 
when it comes to trust lending, they're basically outsourcing. Technically, that's how I see it. They're basically outsourcing that assessment to an accountant. And so they're saying to an accountant, hey, Mr. Accountant, can you please assess this trust as whether it's profitable or not, right? Accountants don't put risk margins. Accountants don't shave incomes. Accountants are, well, cash coming in, cash going out is the net plus one or minus, right? And so they're purely looking at it from a cash flow perspective, right? And that's the game changer, right? So a property could be positive cash flow from your perspective, but it would still be negative cash flow. And same property, you place it in a trust and it's a positive cash flow property. And then the world changes completely, right? Oh, 100%. And especially when you're limited to your like what you can borrow, right? That's where 100%. it becomes quite a challenge. And even then we look and migrate to the self-employed guys, you know, they might be having a bad year. Yeah. They might have a good year, you yeah. know, in another year. During that good year, they might acquire all these assets. But in a bad year, if they didn't place those properties in trust, and the trust in a good year, they might pay down some of the debt and trust, make it profitable. So yeah. in a bad year, they can still borrow money mm. and do other things in their own personal life or keep on buying more properties in another trust or another vehicle. 100%. Uh, so yeah, the strategy or the structure from day one is critical. And, you know, people, I get this a lot. They're like, oh, why don't I just set up a trust of property free? Yeah. You know, and like, no, it's too late. <laughs> You've already ran out of borrowing power. You yes. maxed out your individual name. You're going to have to sell some stuff in order to yeah. now start this mechanism. Yeah. You know? So, you know, it's really important to have the kind of that end vision in mind or, you know, the bigger picture in mind. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think we discussed briefly. I have clients who come to me and they get, look, we want to buy 10 properties, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, look, based on your salary, you can buy three, mm. you know, but if we follow a strategy, it's going to take some time. Yeah. Um, but, really. you know, if we start from day dot, it costs you more money to set up a trust, costs you more fees, might be more land tax if you end up in New South Wales, but other states are okay. Yeah. So a lot of things that it's going to cost you, but that might be a few thousand dollars a year. Big 100%. picture, that property might be 500 grand more in eight, nine years, right? 100%. So, you know, people just don't see it sometimes. You just need, really need to, you know, get that really big picture big mind. Picture. Yeah. yeah. And I think people also don't understand, you know, you made a really important point that, you know, trust is not the magical pill that solves all the problems, right? You know, you need to think about trust first before your personal investing. If you've done all of these investments into your personal aim and then you think that the trust is magically going to solve the problems, that's not the case, right? Mm. I always use this example of a kid, right? When a kid is born, you know, he's not getting up and walking and eating on his own, right? You know, basically feeding them and, you know, growing them up. And they get to like 20 years of age before you can look upon them and say, hey, go work and, you know, it's my time to retire. You know, I'm talking about old school mentality, mm -hmm. right? Trust is exactly that, right? You have to basically, it's dependent on you for the first one year, two year. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to raise them, grow them, and then they are there to benefit you, right? Yeah. So it's that mindset. A lot of people don't see it or don't. Like they never, they the reason they don't see it is because they're looking at today, they're not yes. looking in the future, right? So, 100%. But we can't, obviously, we don't have a crystal ball. But you know, I've got, I've got clients who set up trusts to buy properties eight years ago, right? Yeah. And they bought properties which were negatively geared and didn't, yeah. But look at what happened with rent lately, yeah. And all of their trusts are now deemed profitable, you 100%. Know, because they because they've held long enough, yeah, they haven't sold anything in the trust. Yeah. Rates have gone up, obviously, during that low rate period. Yeah. We're fixing rates down at, you know, the low twos. They became yeah. profitable then. So, yeah. You know. And that's another important point that you make, right? I think a lot of accountants confuse people, right? Because there is a mortgage strategy and there is an accountant strategy. And then the buyer's agent is basically trying to become the catalyst between the two, right? A lot of accountants would basically say point blank, oh, you should never buy a negatively geared property. I, and I understand why is, why they're saying that. You should never buy a negatively geared property in a trust because you're locking your losses. You can claim that in your own personal name. But what they're not seeing is if the rents keep go growing and if they keep paying the debt down, then in year two or year three or year four, you know, you're in a position where the trust debt is basically, you know, disappeared from your balance sheet completely. Oh, yeah. And you get your servicing back, right? And so they don't foresee that far at all. And even for the self-employed guys, if they have, for instance, they they have a trust that owns their business or trading trust, they can distribute the profits over. You know, so there's a lot of a lot of different mechanisms, I guess. Yeah, all um, money back. Yeah. yeah, correct. Yeah. What's the importance of selling bad investments for better opportunities? I see these pe people making this mistake all the time, right? So a lot of the investors, they'll go out there, buy maybe two properties, three properties in their lifetime. You know, that's an average investor out there right now. And the reason people are always like sort of scared of selling their investments ever, like you know, they'll hold on to them 
imagining that you know one day something magical is going to happen and you know this you know this investment is going to start reaping benefits don't get yourself taken on a ride by property spookers so-called property investment advisors or buyers agents who are selling house and land packages or off the plan properties or apartments get yourself a copy of this book called the millennials guide to property investing this book is not just for millennials. The title suggests, but it's actually the most advanced way of investing in property. Now, this book will relate to your clients, your colleagues, and other business owners. There are so many property spookers out there who have come out of the woodwork over the last three or five years, and there is so much misinformation out there that I had to write a book about all the F-ups that people can actually avoid in order to be super successful in the property investment journey. Some of these are really easy to identify, but they are so costly to fix once these mistakes are made. So it's a short book, it's easy to read, it has a lot of stories, it has a lot of examples, and it is a true guide for people who want to do it themselves. My name is Moxin Reza. This is my story and a lot of you will relate to parts of this story if you're not born in the riches and if you're trying to build a property portfolio that can last generations and help you improve your lifestyle along the way. So I give you a chance to come out there and have a read. Be kind, stay safe, keep smiling, keep investing and please do check out the book. Yeah, so I've yeah, I'm I'm one of those suckers for that myself. Unfortunately, a long time ago, I bought a uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll share it. I, yeah, I bought yeah. a, I bought a unit in a high density building. I held it for almost nine years. I knew Ouch. every single time that I needed to get rid of this thing, I could have replaced it, yep. or um, even for a cheaper property, a much better property, right? That's actually going to cost me less to hold. But, you know, the stubbornness inside of me, I know this is what people do, right? And it's the ego, right? I yeah. made a mistake. I made a million yeah, dollars. At some point, it's going to go up. Right? Yeah. I, I kept telling myself that. And then I think it was one day I was just going to... Self-conscious bias. You're like, you know, oh, look at this, you know, new shopping center that's built around this and blah. Thing. That is exactly what that was, right? You know, I wish I wish I had myself in my later version to, to have taught me these lessons, of, you know, that I probably wouldn't have taken off myself. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, that's very true. So it's... um. From from our experience or from my even personal experience, like I, I was able to let go of that property eventually. I mean, I think it was after nine years, so it made $40,000. Yeah. If it's negative gearing over the last nine years, probably cost me $40,000 <laughs> with the amount of strata fees and everything else. So I, I think I lost 40 grand on yeah. the transaction. Yeah. But by letting go of that property, I was able to then, you know, we talked on the other episode about porting loans. I, yeah. I was able to actually port that loan back to my own occupier which had heaps of equity in it yeah keep the mortgage pay down the debt and then debt recycle I don't know if you ever talked about it on your episodes but then re-borrow basically put the money to pay it down then re-borrow against that yeah yeah re redraw or re-borrow yeah to make it tax deductible for for other investment properties which then I was able to take a low doc loan at the time because I didn't did my tax returns as we discussed <laughs> and then, no, I think so two important points that you make right so one is very important that you know people hold on to these things and they think about the loss that you make but you, you, the opportunity cost of that loss like that oh, 400,000 or 500,000 dollars that's sitting there for 10 years that could have been like one and a half million dollar property right if you've been I, I knew I made the mistake maybe yeah. like when I settled the property and it was 150 grand and down, and down on that you know when I was in my early 20s right yeah I knew I made the mistake, but I was too stubborn to sell it, right? And I look back, if I I had a, bought a property at the same time, yeah. yeah, and this property has gone up probably close to a million dollars, right? Yeah. And I could have just even done a portability and just swapped that for that same like-for-like -like property. I would have been a million dollars ahead, but I would have sold it. So yeah, the opportunity cost is ridiculous. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You, you, you know what Get rid of those kind of properties, figure out ways to get more And it's okay, like I always say this to people, it's okay to take that loss. You know, I have a client and it's going, he's, and she's going through a similar scenario and we had a really detailed chat, right? And she's losing, and this is a unit in Chatswood and, you know, apologies for calling this out. I'm sure that she listens to every episode of mine and she'll probably call me as soon as this goes live. $200,000 in loss in a single unit, you know, this building is ridden with issues. Oh, yeah. It's ridden. No, not chats with Chats, Castle Hill. It's mm -hmm. ridden with issues, right? No one would buy a property there. You know, you can't sell the bank won't issue the funds. You know, there is no finance available for people buying properties. That's how bad that strata, you know, unit mm -hmm. is, right? 
$200,000 in losses. And I was like, and so she was like, you know, what should I do? I've held this for like, you know, X amount of years. And I was like, think about it from this perspective, right? If you change this, you know, and she's bought like four properties with us that has grown by almost half a million dollars anyway, mm. like literally 16 months, right? I was like, if this loan basically gets ported out, okay? So you don't close it. You just port out this loan and you sell off this property. And I give, I deliver exactly what I've delivered for you in the last 16 months. You would not only recoup the losses, but you would be ahead basically by doing that. And she was like, yeah, but it's a cash flow impact. And I was like, it's not like if you think about it. Yeah. And it almost took like four months for her to, you know, get her like brain going because mm. it is a big loss, right? I'll tell yeah. you, you've bought something for 800, you're selling it for 600. You know, you're not even allowing for holding costs, et cetera. But, you know, sometimes you need to buy that, you know, silver. Oh, of course. And, you know, that's probably holding back on even borrowing capacity. You know, it's just sitting there, exactly. filling it up, right? But yeah. Can- it's wasting precious resources yeah. that can go elsewhere. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that's very, very important. Um, the other thing that you talked about was debt recycling. So let's paddle back, you know, let's open up that floor. I know everyone talks about debt recycling, but no one actually explains how debt recycling really works. Yeah. So debt recycling is simply, put in very simple terms, is paying down your, you know, so probably the easiest example is, you know, somebody's been paying down their mortgage for a long time and they go, we're going to go and buy an investment property. We've saved up 20% yeah, and we're going to put a deposit into buying an investment property, yeah. right? And they don't even think, they don't speak to their accountant. Yeah. Uh, okay. They don't just go and do it, right? And then they tell their accountant after they've done the fact and go, oh, yeah, yeah look, I already still borrowed 80%. What that recycling is essentially is that, you know, you could push that into your mortgage to pay it down yeah, and then just use the redraw functionality of it. Yeah. Because that reopens up the debt, you know, yes. it, it technically means that you've borrowed against your own occupier to yeah. portion that amount or even so split it off. Deductible. Yeah, to make it tax deductible so you can make 100% tax deductible against the investment. Yeah. Um, I, I actually use this method myself to, to, I guess, go through trying to pay off my house. Uh, and I did it time in, time out, you know, because I, I, I just didn't want to take more leverage at the time mm. and I just wanted to keep yeah. you know, buying more properties. But yeah. that was a... That was a Smart way yeah. to do it. I think people always get scared that you know them paying down their principal place of residence which is like you know the non-tax deductible then would get that money basically get stuck but if it's a smart astute broker you know they'll always ensure that there is money at the other end right yeah you know they always think about oh you know if i put this money in what if i don't get it out right you know that's the mentality and the huge benefit also is that you're getting own occupier rates technically on that fund asset right so it's a little bit Oh, it's not, you know, not the be or end or to be the rate, but, you know, pressure yeah. point three, point four, it's, yeah. it all helps. Yeah. You know, I mean, overall perspective, you're not, there is no cash outlay, right? I think people get confused mm-hmm. that they think that, oh, you know, I'm losing money here. Well, you're technically not, right? Basically, you know, you, as you were saying before, you're chew, chewing your own fat. Yeah, you're chewing your own fat. You're still a mindset thing, you know, understanding that it's all just money is, it's all just numbers and where, where they sit Correct. at any given time. So. Yeah. It's not about, oh, I saved this or I done, I done that, you know. Yeah. Once you shift away from that mindset of, you know, looking at the numbers as, you know, yeah, money you save, they're really just, it's just money and numbers. Right? Right. And what's going to give you the most efficient outcome is what you want. Right. So we talked about structures, you've talked about strategy, you've talked about selling of bad investments. Um, there is one topic that is really near and dear to my heart, and this is loyalty to the bank, you know. Not if. Do you need to be loyal to a single bank? Or is do you think the bank is loyal to you? <laughs> yeah, it is. So that's probably yeah. It's kind of like that reverse question. So no, you shouldn't. Like it's Should you, you, with your eggs in all one basket, and I, you know, just go to one bank and say, "Oh, it's so much easier. They have all my pay slips. You know, my income is coming there. I'll just bank with one bank." Uh, absolutely not. Like you need to go to a good broker, somebody who's going to talk about you know the end goal in mind, figure out the strategy. Bank is a transactional. We all know that. Yeah, I've never met a good banker who was not transactional. Um, and the ones that I have met that were not, tra- they became brokers. Yeah. You know, they became very good brokers, you know, top top 100 brokers, every yeah. single one of them, right? So anyone who could actually understand the mechanics of helping people and growing long term and not be transactional is, is no longer a banker. So yeah, loyalty is not going to give you anything in that sense. Uh, maybe in the commercial business banking space, it, it can marginally give you some advantage uh, but that comes with your own personal character and a, and a good commercial business broker 
also has the same, if not stronger relationships with banks um, that will allow them to push. Yeah. Depending on what you need at any given time yeah. anyway. Um, but yeah, leaving everything at one bank is a danger zone. You, you know, you're just basically asking if you ever get in trouble yeah. or more trouble because although they're not cross collateralized and every property is mm. going to be a standalone. Yeah. If you do go into trouble, the bank will find a way yes. to stuff you up on every other property because they can control over it, right? And it's, so, you know, it's best to spread your spread your eggs out, not, yeah. not just be stuck in one place. The other thing that I learned, and this was 2016 lesson with NAB, and I'm calling NAB out because I hate them with passion now, um, is basically they just know too much about you. Like, you can't go under the radar. As a business owner, you know, your whole life is about being under the radar, right? You know, you want to make sure that the bank just knows enough for them to understand your risk capital, mm-hmm. right? They know exactly where you are eating. They know exactly, you know, where your kids are going. They know exactly how much is money coming in, money going out from each and every business. And so you can't literally be creative at all if you are loyal to a single bank and you provide everything to one bank. Yeah, it's, it's very limiting, I guess. You know, they and they will go through everything that you declare and not based on like what you would spend based on having the next deal done. Correct. Because people are just as we all know, and you know like yeah. for when they're acquiring another property, yeah. If you know, you're smart enough, you know that I need to, you know, knuckle down, get another four hundred cash flow for now. Hundred percent support this. Yeah, readjust my numbers on the, you know, as they come, right? Yeah. Uh, but the bank is, you know, when they're assessing you, they're assessing your past. And you're like, yeah. well, wait a second. Now we're looking at what happened. Oh, mate, you went out and ate, you know, wagyu beef for the last six <laughs> months. <laughs> and folds grade every day now. <laughs> it's. It's yeah. very true. That's very true. And you might be as a business owner, you might have traveled, you know, three or four times, you know, in a year for a business trip, but, you know, you might be, you know, moving things around and, yeah. you know, that m- money might be coming through various different places, right? Or, you know, you might have, you know, six different cars in different entities, right? And so, yeah. A lot of people actually, when they're stuck to their own bank, they're cross collateralized and they don't even know it. Do you know how many times I have to get clients call the bank to say, hey, are you secure as Clorox cross? Yeah, I like. And they're like, nah, nah, they're not cross. I'm like, I almost guarantee. They're like, I bought this property. I borrowed a hundred percent on this other property. They just gave me the full. Loan. <laughs> like, you are crossed. They don't. <laughs> you, you are crossed. They, they should have drew twenty percent equity plus yeah. costs, and they should have took an eighty percent loan. People yeah. don't understand that you know refinancing the money out and then using that money because that money is a lot more important than the the new debt the bank is going to give you is a lot more important. I had a similar scenario. The reason I hate now with passion. This is two thousand sixteen. I was basically buying my principal base of residence at that time when I moved back to Melbourne in 2017. And there was this one particular development project that I was doing and I was acquiring a second debt with them. And I had an amazing relationship manager. She was great, you know, one phone call away. And, you know, I had no brokers. I was like, this bank is amazing. And I still remember, right? So I sent her an email. I said, I don't want any loans cross-collateralized. I want them individually set up. And she said, yes, everything is fine. No problem. And she got me into a city one day and she's like, sign here, 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 here. And I was like, cool. I parked the car, put the meter on for 20 minutes. I w- ran in the bank, sign, 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 got in the car, left, right? 20, I think 18, I decided to sell my you know, development stock because it was going through development. And the broker at that time, because I shifted to the broker, he's like, nah, it's all crossed. And I was like, nah, can't be. I showed him the email. He said, nah, it's, cool. it's crossed. And so I went back to the bank and I, shared, and I showed it to them that I requested this not to be cross-collateralized and you've done it. And they shit themselves like, because of course, you know, mm. but they're like, well, you signed the documents. And I was like, yeah, but like she got me in for literally like five minutes, got the documents out. I read nothing. And they're like, oh no, the liability sits with you. It does not sit with us, you know. Uh, no matter what you request, it does not really matter. And so that's how like rigid and painful these people can be. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, um, well, not on the bank's behalf. I mean, like, as a banker, I was a business banker once too. Yeah. And I would never cross, but yeah. there was people that would, like, they would have conversations yeah. about crossing their customers, linking everything, GSAs, linking everything so that you can't leave them. Because the worst thing for a business banker for their bonus or profit share is if you leave. Really? So they want to see the highest profitability. So they don't want to adjust your rates if they don't have, they never want to call you, hey, Locks. Uh, you're at eight percent. I'll bring you down to six and a half. Yeah, because it's gonna decrease my bonus. Yeah, <laughs> as if they're gonna ever do that, right? So I don't know about nowadays, but this is I'm going back a long time ago when yeah. I was working for banks. 
yeah, so it was all about profitability. You wanted pe- people wanted to cross everything. They wanted to link everything they could, take more security, protect the bank in that instance. The mm-hmm. bank wants you to take more security. Yeah, but then later down the track, it starts you up when you need to do things. Yeah, you know, flick off things, get creative. If you're developing a site, yeah, bank has not acceptable security. Whatever happens at that point in time, you've really got to have somebody in your court that's very strategic, and one banker isn't isn't going to do that for you. Hundred okay. percent. Yeah, and I think also like when you talk about not keeping all your own loans with one bank or, you know, not keeping everything with one bank. Like, I think the broker has access to so many different products that, you know, certain certain times the bank's policy would be so rigid or they might not be able to, you know, oh, give you some sort of yeah. debt leverage that you're really looking for. Especially if you're, like, if you're a pretty savvy investor and you're trying to build this portfolio out or you're doing small developments or you're doing, like, really good broker is important, you know. So, yeah. Um, like even a site that we're doing now, for example, there was, there's a, like a vacant land lot that we need to port loads into. <laughs> and we went to the right bank that accepts vacant land for ports, right? Wow. So, and it's sitting on a $5 million site that, yeah. you know, well, what happened was we ported, we subdivided the bottom lots basically, yeah. and the bottom lots are being sold, but we don't want to close the debt facility because uh, they want to keep that debt facility. Yeah. To then do other other things, other things. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But nobody's going to accept vacant land as land bank, so that would you know. Yeah. So, but this lender allows us to sell off these lots and then keep revalue the top and keep the load. Wow, which is amazing, right? Yeah, so things like that. Just getting you know, you really need to have somebody really good in your court with this the stuff, especially if you're a really savvy yeah. investor doing small developments or even a larger scale kind of development. Uh, whoever you are, you just you just need you need an A team, right? Definitely, yeah, definitely. Uh, bringing this all back together, if you're running out of borrowing capacity or borrowing power, let's sum it up. What should you do? Yeah, so I think, you know, first of all, when you are starting your journey, you know, talk to somebody who's very strategic, obviously with the end goal in mind, whether it's buying in trust, individual names, that kind of stuff. If you already hit your cap, you uh, if you are salaried or self-employed, it's going to be very different. You have to maybe consider selling something in your individual name to then hopefully be, re- be able to rebuild this journey. Um, you know, obviously with the self-employed guys, there might be some more options, including low doc funders. Yeah. And then when you, if you are a savvy investor, you really need to speak to somebody who can kind of look at all the different options where you don't get stuck to the one bank. 100%. And, uh, you know, make sure you spread those eggs out. Golden words. Um, I always say this, that, you know, you cannot have a million dollar dream with the poor man's habits. So you need to think like a million dollar person in order to take that sort of risk. So it's very, very important. 100%. Thank you for coming out today. Um, where can people find you? Uh, yeah, so just jump on our website, uh, www.strategicbrokersingular.com.au. As I said to Box before, I couldn't afford the S. That's why <laughs> some guy ransomed me for it. I just cost too much. <laughs> but yeah, reach out there. You can contact us. Uh, just reach out to my name if you want. Then um, yeah, shoot me an email. Thank, uh, thank you very much for coming out. For people who are listening and watching, You know, if you have any stories to share in relation to selling off bad investments, please do in the comments below. Um, Thank you for listening to us. Be kind, take care, keep smiling, keep investing. This is Moss and Home checking out. Adios.